Okay, we set? I feel like Britney Spears. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I see a lot of villagers out there. I, I design villages. Um, I help, as my Andrew was saying, I help people retrofit their neighborhoods with gathering places. And uh, tonight, I'm, I'm going to be talking about Dignity Village. People have different impressions of it, so tonight I'm really hoping to help set the record straight. Uh, because um, I think, you know, unless you've really visited there, it's, uh, it's hard to really know the story. So I'll have some good visuals, and uh, I'll show you some of the documents that have been formed, and I'll tell you a bit about uh, how, um, how we actually arrived at a place that has the lightest ecological footprint of all communities in Portland, Oregon and the highest rate of political participation of all. And I'm going to be talking about Dignity Village, but I really want to talk about villages because for one thing I'm obsessed with them. Um, I mean, I live in America and I notice there's towns, there's cities, there's neighborhoods. I notice that most of the places that we live in were created by developers who didn't either have experience with uh, villages where you always have a community heart, there's always a village square or a zocalo or a plaza or a piazza or if you're Greek, a platea or if you're German, a platz or if you're French, French, a pla, a place. Except in American neighborhoods, there's nothing. So I'm, I'm interested in the village, frankly, because in villages, people have higher, I mean, a higher quality of life and a lower incidence of violence between people by sometimes a factor of 10. I'm talking about the lands of our own ancestors. So I'm interested in the village, because I think we're all still villagers. Because after all, it was in the village where people first figured out how to listen to each other and how to speak. We first learned how to count and sing. You know, we found that there was a conducive place that was kind of interesting and beautiful. There was water there. People were attracted to it. They sat down and somehow they figured out how to communicate. And we eventually created fire, you know, and out of that crossroads of our lives emerged all forms of cultural expression that became the village. Cities, neighborhoods, westward expansion, manifest destiny, whatever it is that's going on in the western United States especially, isn't very village-like. Because we have the lowest number of outdoor gathering places of all first world nations and the highest incidence of violence between people. So I want to talk about villages because I think we're still villagers. I mean, you know, when we have a family and we make a commitment to a place and we have children and we dream of a better world, we're being villagers. Cities, you know, the, 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 the empires, and the, the aggressive city-states of history that went out to attack villages and take their land and appropriate their cultural expressions and integrate them into empires, there's a whole lot of that in the idea that you would live in a place that you didn't create and you would only consume it as a product, always looking for a better place maybe. Why can't the places where we live become better places? So I'm interested in talking about villages because um, I think there's a great cultural promise in them. There's a great uh, fulfillment of our destiny in them. A great aesthetic experience. I mean, I notice we save our money to travel across the oceans to go visit these places. <laughs> and we come back saving money to go again. And I know there are people who have been dragged, kicking, and screaming to get on the plane. Like, honey, come on. We're going to go back to Florida. You know? And when, when he just really wants to stay in some little Italian village. Because it's walkable, it's beautiful, everything's kind of in its place. And I don't want to overly romanticize, but frankly, if, you're, if your public health statistics are telling you that the quality of life is higher and the incidence of violence is lower, it's something to pay attention to. So, yeah, we can talk about homelessness, but what I'm really excited about is the idea that the village is so powerful. The idea that a group of people can undertake democratic processes in such a way that they can repair themselves and create a sustainable expression, I think that's of interest to everybody. Because as I said, Dignity Village, you know, when we started it in Portland, Oregon, most people were saying, oh, well, we'll see about that, you know. <laughs> and we all have these impressions, not only of homeless people, but of each other. Um, and people were saying, well, you know, how could they possibly do that? They're just, just homeless people. What could they do? What could they know? 
Remember, we're talking about people who have fought for our country, so have respect. We're also talking about mothers. Something went, happened to her, and she ended up on the streets. Some, something stressed her life out so much. People, you know, our own families, and some of you have members of your family who you may, maybe don't even know where they are. Something happened to them. But something's happened in Dignity Village, where people, you know, they have their standards, they're self-governing, they really have their act together, and they're not perfect. But as I said, they have become, well, they're not just the, city, the, the, the community with the lowest ecological footprint, they're actually the only one that has managed to successfully address global warming by having the lowest carbon footprint. They're the most walkable and the most talkable community of all. Most gathering places per square foot, most participating voters per capita, more, more by far than all the other neighborhoods. So there's something going on. A person can come into that place, and for the, maybe for the first time in their life, they have to take responsibility. They like to have to be part of the village maintenance crew. They have to be part of the, the security system. Maybe they get elected because of their, 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 their good works to become part of the village council. And maybe they can even become the village chair. People who maybe had been living under a bridge or in a doorway for years. But let me tell you how I got started in this. I first heard about this initiative to start um, standing together to keep each other safe um, by a group of six homeless people, and about half of them were women. Somebody invited me to come listen to the discussions that they were having about what they wanted to do. They didn't want to make anyone mad, but they wanted to make a point, and they wanted to undertake this su successful initiative. In Portland, the anti-camping ordinance had just been overturned. A judge said, well, this is ridiculous. You're criminalizing, you're arresting people just because they have nowhere to sleep. That's unconstitutional. You can't say just because a person is impoverished that they're a criminal. So he threw it out. And the police continued to enforce the anti-camping ordinance. So then it was like, well, now who's breaking the law here? So it was kind of questionable. But I went. I was invited to come listen to what they were talking about because the the, the editor of the Street Roots newspaper um, had heard about my work on behalf of village making. He said, why don't you just come and listen? They're, they're not going to really be interested in hearing what you have to say for a while, so you might have to come to some meetings to build some trust. And finally, you know, finally I, I, I was involved in the conversation. But from the very beginning, I was engaged with a commitment, because when I walked up to the door, a woman came to greet me, and she looked me right in the eyes, and she held my hands, and she said, if you're thinking about whether or not you want to help us, I just want to ask you, if you can imagine what it's like to be a woman alone on the streets of a city every night. And I, I never imagined that. So I was like, okay, I'll listen. And I came back to every meeting. And eventually, uh, eventually we transitioned the village, vis the vision from the idea of a camp that would take a stand on behalf of a principal. Like there were people that were saying, I will die for this cause. And, and everyone was like, yeah, that's really great enthusiasm, but will you live for it? You know, it's, it's one thing to dream of going down, because you have no hope. It's another thing entirely to have enough hope to imagine that you could win your cause and bring everyone along and benefit everybody and, and stand your ground. But I was committed from the start. So um, I want to kind of get into the slides now. So about villages. Many of you have been to this place. It's one of the most beautiful in all the world. And I'm not trying to say that Opportunity Village will necessarily become this. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to say it's going to be more cool than this. But this is maybe the most beautiful public space in all the world. Um, it's a shell-shaped, convex, south-facing piazza, the Piazza del Campo. It's the, literally the intersection of the trade routes between Pisa, Milan, Rome, and Florence that met in a meadow up in the hills of Tuscany. And, um, they retained the great meadow, they built up around its edges. At first it was kind of a camp, and then it kind of became more, you know, more and more dense. But they kept honoring the pathways of their ancestors. And it's, it's basically what you call a geomorphic settlement. Most people in the world do not live in grids like we do. They live in a, in a geomorphic place, which means people are paying attention to the light and the rain and the wind. They're nestling into the land. They're building out of the available materials. And it's an ecological response that is an expression of a participating culture that learns from itself. And I'm not trying, again, I'm not trying to romanticize them because nobody is perfect. Nobody really wants to be perfect either because where, where would your drama be anyway? <laughs> you gotta have some drama. 
But a, a village is a place where people can walk and talk. They don't have to talk about getting together on a certain time and date and having potluck in order to build a community. They don't even have to talk about building community if the village has developed organically over time, honoring the choices of your ancestors, building the, the roads over the pathways that your people have trod all this time. So you're out there walking and talking. You know the stories that are all around you. Everyone around you is a story. You know their story. You feel you know, safe there. And I, I guess I maybe I'm romanticizing a little bit, but I do notice their crime rates are multiple times lower. And they are extremely attractive places to go, infused with art and beauty. But because we only visit these places, um, I mean, unless you really get into your ancestors, like, yes, I have Celtic history, and you, and you go and figure out what that is. Unless you really make it your interest, you might not remember that these are places where children are safe, way safer than they are where we live. Because people are talking, they have relational networks, they have relational economies with each other, and girls, little girls, have places where they, 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 they go, and people know that they're there, and if suddenly one of them is not there, everybody will know. And then they grow older, their stories are intertwined, they don't really aspire to go elsewhere because they're so deeply embedded in the idea and identity of the place. This is true for everybody. Um, you know, I, I think the, the aberrant behavior and the crazy stuff that's happening in our country right now is largely a product of social isolation, truly. I mean, in, in village space, it's, it's, it's an aberrant condition. Not only do we not have gathering places in our country, around those gathering places are co supposed to cohere organizational structures, village councils, that have networks throughout the place where people are living. And they know what's going on, and they deal with it. If a child goes missing, you can figure it out real fast. And, it's, and, and nobody goes to work until you've found that little girl. I don't think the men go quite as crazy as they go around here, I think. They sit around in public space, being mentors, being present, being storytellers, you know, doing the things that men are meant to do, I guess. And, uh, and it's a multi-generational thing. A whole lot of trust and deep identity with people. So when we're talking about Opportunity Village, I know that there's a whole lot of impressions that we have about each other. And not just about each other, but about homeless people in general. Um, but in a village, you get to know a bit more about each other. This amazing thing happened in my own neighborhood. Uh, last weekend, where two men had a fender bender, and they had knew nothing about each other, they thought, and they started to argue, and they started to push and shove each other, and somebody who knew them both happened to be present, and helped them realize, I'm like, don't you guys know you went to third grade with each other, you fools? And suddenly they were crying. You know, I mean, I have a lot of stories like that from all this community building, where people discover, oh my god, your dad saved my dad in World War II? You know, do you need some help? You know, there's all these assumptions we make about each other, and we're making assumptions about people we don't really know, who might well come to our rescue if we, if we needed help. So a village is not a place where people just drive into their garage and don't interact with other people. A village is not a place that has been generated and developed by somebody else just for profit. A village is not a place where people are not present at noon because they're off in a work zone. I mean, we, we live in home zones and we go to work zones. And at the end of the day, after working really hard and not really building community where we work, we come home and we're too tired to build community where we live. And this is something we never agreed to, the idea that living and working would be disintegrated. I mean, that's how you build culture. Those things have to be proximate. So we never agreed to that, and that is not a village. And yet, we are villagers. We can retrofit where we live to make it work as well as it ever did. Whether you live in a less dense condition or a really dense condition, if somebody has designed your world and called it a home zone and said, oh, no, no, you can't create local economy there, you can't create livelihood, you're going to have problems. And as you add more and more people, um, as you densify and compound, if you don't create more space for interaction and more ways for people to create together, you will, your problems will compound. Um, I don't know, I mean, we're in church right now, and it just occurs to me that the, the notion of loving your neighbor becomes really, really difficult if you can't even work together and create livelihood. I mean, it remains an aspiration as opposed to a daily reality. The idea that you go to a mall, and it's so village-like, all the little shops in the narrow little lanes reminds you of the places that you visited in Europe, and then you go back to the home zone. This is a silliness. 
You know, I got this Christmas card a few years ago, and I thought, what is this, a cruel joke? <laughs> you know, this beautiful human scale community, it's got everything Kevin Lynch, the, guy, the author of The Image of the City, who, who codified placemaking back in the 60s, was talking about gateways, pathways, gathering places, memory spaces, the great central village heart, sy symbolic places, and here it is on a Christmas card. And I'm thinking, this is not good enough every couple of years to get a Christmas card. I want my village now. That's how I feel about it. It's not good enough to just be driving along and looking at restaurants trying to convince you that they're a village. That's not a village. Wait, you got some grandmother in there making the lunch? Or this. The balloons don't fool anybody. Like, Portland Village with balloons. Like, no, this is, this is a bunch of people who work at a, at a microchip manufacturing facility west of Portland in Washington County. And as much as you break down the scale of these actually huge buildings um, and color them differently and add different details, there's still condo developments where people are not present as in, with any kind of local economy. They barely know or talk to each other. So some of the work we're doing to retrofit the village back into the American community looks like this. Outrageous, liberal, progressive. No, actually, you know what? There was a, a very conservative man um, in Ohio where I was just doing a little presentation about <coughs> villages, who said, you know what, I thought this was just a progressive deal, but now I can say, by God, what, what good is freedom of assembly without a place to assemble? <laughs> Isn't that an issue of common cause? So, I mean, we're talking about cool stuff. We're talking about the coolest stuff. Um, you know, Shakespeare talked about the theater of life, and this is exactly what we're talking about, where people go to be seen and to see each other. You always know that something will be happening in the village square. So in the Sunnyside Piazza, liberals and conservatives together decided to create a little common ground. They were disagreeing about everything else, but they could agree on the idea that the logo of the neighborhood, the sunflower, could be put down in the street to help them to build a little community. So they designed it, they fundraised, they installed it. And the city lets them do it for free to as many intersections in their neighborhood as they want, because everything goes right when you do this, like literally. American Journal of Public Health has published studies that say people's health improves mentally and physically. They get out and interact more often with each other, and apparently crime goes down, and they even believe that traffic is slow. Nine out of ten people say that, without stop signs. I don't know, I, I, if I saw a huge sunflower in the road, I'd probably pull over and get out. <laughs> oh, here. And the kids are involved in the process. Um, Somebody pointed out to me, it was actually my ex-wife, that after all, um, you know, it's mostly white men between 35 and 70 that are designing the world around us and all of our economic and political systems. So she said, no wonder everything's going wrong. <laughs> but she is one of my best friends, and uh, I totally agreed with her. In fact, it was a very agreeable discussion, but um, I think she's absolutely right. I mean, if you've got guys that can barely hug laying out your world, how are things going to go very right? We need people with a broader emotional spectrum to be participating. Somebody once said something about the children inheriting the world anyway, or, or rather the meek inheriting the world, and, 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 and the imperative to listen to children. And community building processes at their best do that. Democracy at its best does that. You don't need to be 18 to have a good idea. And at the <coughs> local level, we can do that. And I, frankly, I think that's more, that's more of a democratic expression. Community building, potlucking, getting out, you know, getting a little sweaty together, and teaching other people how to use tools that sort of thing. That's democracy, where you undertake an idea directly and you don't have to wait around, you don't have to work for campaign financing, uh, camp campaign finance reform. <coughs> so this is what it looks like on the ground, just people out doing things, and they live right there, it's their place. Looks like this. They start to like each other a whole lot. Who knows what happens after the hand-holding? Maybe kissing. <laughs> Here's where the uh, most conservative development agency in the city of Portland, the Portland Development Commission, is saying, we want a village, we want people who participate and talk. <coughs> so they've helped to configure the financing of this amazing project that creates a kind of hybrid courtyard, driving court, walking promenade, um, and at the same time the buildings end up costing about 125000 per house, per, per family-sized house, the highest standard of green design right now. National Endowment for the Arts is behind this concept. They actually funded Bay City, Oregon, about seven miles north of Tillamook, to undertake a process of retroactively installing a village landscape on top of the grid of their city. 
Um, I supported them for many thousands of dollars to undertake a 25-year vision process, I mean a process that would result from their vision. So here's just some of the images from their process. The idea of retrofitting their landscape with all kinds of walkable and talkable features, gathering places, and interactive amenities, especially including for the first time in the history of the town, a village square. How can you live for more than 100 years without a gathering place at the center of your town, frankly? So, the idea of the village, the reemergence of a village-based mentality is really happening broadly, and not just in Portland, Oregon, but all these examples are, are from Oregon and most of them from Portland. Um, this is again Bay City, but uh, the urge to have a place, a commons, is a, is a broadly felt urge. This one here is, um, is called the Rebuilding Center of Our United Villages. And when we first started designing this building, very understandably, the neighbors were concerned. They were saying, well, you're talking about making a building out of recycled materials. Won't that threaten our property values? I think it was a reasonable, reasonable concern. And I think this is an important question, and everyone should be respectful. And we got through the process by listening to everybody. Their best, everybody's best ideas were incorporated. How to locate the entrances, how to scale the building, how to break up the mass how to texture it, and the building is mostly made out of the fabric of residential materials anyway, so it really fits in in a lot of ways. Got all these awards and things like that. The best thing is, it helped to rejuvenate the entire Mississippi corridor. It's the anchor for the rejuvenation of the economy of the area, so everybody's benefiting. In fact, the property values are, are doing much better than they were before. Everybody comes from within walking distance. They all have a say in running the organization. Everybody has a living wage, and their entire families are covered for full dental and health benefits. Incredible. And when you go inside, everything's pennies on the dollar compared to Home Depot or Lowe's. These uh, French doors there on the right um, are double insulated, code proof doors for about $65 for the pair. Whereas, I mean, how much would you pay at Home Depot for that? But the beautiful thing is, not only do you pay less, everybody gets way more. And it's because you've, you've cut the, the vampire-like corporation um, out of the equation. And so instead of extracting so much from the community, it gets folded back in for community improvement. So, I mean, they're trying to be a village. Their parent organization is Our United Villages. They intend to uplift the entire city and make it more participatory. So when we're talking about a village, we're talking about a participatory culture. One that is there, ready, at, at each other service and at the service of everyone around them. Dignity Village, I should say, Dignity Village, when, even before they were formulated into a permanent settlement, wherever they would go, they would partner with the people around them. They would ask the community, what do you need? What can we do? And people would always say, we need eyes on the street. We want to help avert vandalism. We want to slow traffic. We want to clean up the streets. We want to get the garbage off the streets. And, the, and, and when we were legalizing this project with the city council, the police showed up to testify. And they had all these wonderful bar graphs and stuff. And they said, frankly, wherever this village has gone, crime has dropped, streets have become safer and cleaner. And, I, I, you know, there are, there are people here who are advocates or, or they're homeless. And you know what I'm talking about when I say people want to feel like they have value. They want to help. And, you know, the other day on the radio, I think maybe it was yesterday or the day before we were talking on uh, using the radio, we were talking about this, and people were expressing legitimate fears. Some people might be dangerous, some people might hurt somebody, and I think that's a, a valid concern. Um, but at the same time, don't forget, um, these, are, these are people with value. Um, almost everyone on the street wants to, wants to help, and, they, and they're looking for a place to belong, like the rest of us. Here's another example of the village. Believe it or not, this is happening. Wealthy people. This guy, is the, the founder of this farm, it's a permaculture-based uh, regenerative pro uh, project with all of the food generated at this farm going to only to Portland, Oregon. So it's an urban agriculture initiative um, that's addressing resource scarcity and you know, all sorts of things like global warming. But it's one of the founding employees of Microsoft. He took a, an ecological design course and he came away saying, oh my god, now I know what to do with my millions. <laughs> now I know what to tell my friends to do with their millions. And uh, this is a fabulous project, a fabulous visionary project. But it's, uh, it's, it's predicated on the idea that there will be a village center and people will work cooperatively there. They will look out for each other and they will seek to up e uplift each other and help each other meet their goals and their needs. Um, there's so much to say about this project, but it's, 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 it's lush and beautiful and it's part of the solution to 
all the problems we're facing as a society. Two different images here. Um, one is of a little girl looking into the eyes of her grandmother, and her grandmother's realizing, okay, you've heard the songs and the stories, and now I know for sure that when I'm gone, things will continue. I talk about security. You know, the little girl has heard the songs, her, her grandmother is present in her life. But what we're not talking about is the idea that our children, you know, end up on milk cartons. And it's just a, yet, yet another anonymous trauma that we have to somehow endure as we hope for a better world. Like the village is a place where things do not go perfectly, but they go way better than that. So that's what we're talking about. I think anybody can do this. Well, frankly, wealthy people have a harder time than anybody. And they're the first ones to admit it. But homeless people can certainly do this, as we've seen with, with Dignity Village. This image here is emblematic of our plight, our common plight. Between the Willamette River and 360th on Northeast Sandy Boulevard, this is the only bench just for sitting. You know, if you were a villager from another country, you might come along and be like, wow, a, a bench. Americans have built a bench. You might feel under the bench for a meter or something, thinking you might be charged for sitting. And you'd sit there and check out the hedge in the parking lot for a while, hoping to get a view, because usually a gathering place has a lovely view. And then you might buy some luggage and decide to get out of there instead from that, from that local business. I mean, this is so normal to us in the United States to not even see a gathering place along on the pathways that we travel every day, that it's just normal. And we see all this stuff happening in the paper that is a consequence of our social isolation. And we don't understand it because we're so busy, so beset by our own business.